everybody. Um, as Emily said, I'm Carla Cicero. I'm the staff curator of ornithology at the Museum of Southwest, um, Southwest Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. And um, so I'm going to go through some of the main features of Arctos focused on the bird collection, but a lot of, um, because Arctos is a shared database, um, of course, a lot of these features are shared with the other collection types. So just to kind of give a, a brief, um, and if people want to ask questions in the chat um, while I'm going through, that's great. Um, Beth can kind of monitor that and we can, we can deal with those at the end. Um, so just to kind of introduce you to, to the bird collections in Arctos. Um, currently Arctos has uh, over 40 collections and uh, bird collections and 467,000 records. And this incl includes, um, bird specimen collections, eggs and nests, um, observational collections, and also teaching collections. And the types of material are highly varied, but typical of what you'd find in ornithology collections. So skin, skeletons, wings, spread wings, fluid parts, eggs and nests. Um, but also because we do have these teaching collections, things like taxidermy mounts um, can be searched in Arctos and media is an important part of of what we do, especially for, for ornithology collections with things like audio recordings. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So I am going to share my screen. And I was telling Emily and Beth, my screen periodically just goes blank. And so, but it's just up blank for like a, a second. So if I pause, that's because I can't see anything. Um, so bear with me. Okay, so share screen, share. Okay, can everybody see that okay? And I'm gonna minimize this thing. Move that down there. Okay, so most of you are probably familiar with Arctos um, at some level. And so I'm gonna start out with some basic things that you can do without being logged in as an operator. And then we'll go into um, features that, that you can um, do as a when you're logged in as an operator with certain permissions. And so the first thing you might want to do is wonder what, what we have generally in terms of bird specimens or bird records in Arctos. And so you can search on, and here you'll see in each of these sort of blocks, you'll see show more options, show fewer options. And so you may need to expand those if you don't have those as your default. Um, once you expand it, it, it stays that way. So you could search on class AVs. And then up at the top, um, you can see results in lots of different ways. So catalog records, as I mentioned, we have over 467,000, so I don't wanna do it that way, but I can see a summary of what we have. Um, I can also look at a map as well, but I wanna see a summary. And then I can group by different um, fields. And so in this case, let's just look and see what we have in the way of bird orders. But you can also obviously look at other things like families, um, genera. You can also do things like geographic fields um, and year. And um, so I, in the abstract, I said that our oldest specimen is from 1830. And that's how I figured that out by, by searching by year. So if I search by order, um, and this may take a little bit of while, um, uh, but it's, it's fairly fast. Um, We'll see what we come up with here. Still, it's getting there, hopefully. Okay. All right, so you can see here all of the different bird orders um, that occur in Arctos. And one thing you'll notice immediately is some of these records have more than one. And you can ask, well, well how is it that you can have be a duck and a falcon? So you can click on the link there. And you'll see that this is a, um, it's in the UTEP, UTEP Institution Earth Sciences. And if you click on that, <clears throat> um, you'll see it's a fossil specimen. So identification is, is not certain. Um, same thing here where you can have 
there's the acid pitriformes is, is in there twice. If you click on that link, Yeah, you can see different things. So there's three MVZ bird records and then two UTEP records. So the two UTEP records are fossils again, either a golden eagle or a bald eagle. And the first MVZ bird record is a hybrid and the second MVZ bird record is an uncertain identification. So I wanted to, so this brings up how we deal with taxonomy and identifications in Arctis. And so we have a taxonomy authority, which is basically the, the formal nomenclature. And then identification will apply those taxonomic names to catalog records. And Arctos has formulas for doing that, which allows you to build identification to accommodate uncertainties such as hybrids, um, such as uncertain identifications or things like hybrids. Um, which are not formal names or, or undescribed species, which are not formal names, but, but um, have taxonomic components to them. Um, and so you might be wondering, one of the common questions we ask is what taxonomy sources does Arctos use? So Arctos has its own taxonomy classification, but it also pulls in different classifications from the global names web service. And so you can search on, on Arctos taxonomy by going to search taxonomy. And under taxon name, you can enter, enter something. So I'm gonna search on Icteria, um, which is a chat. And you'll see here's the genus and then, different, and then the species and different subspecies. And if I search, if I click on Icteria, First, it shows a map, um, but you'll see the data, the Arctos classification at the top, and it has it in the family Icteroidae, um, which is the current classification based on the American Ornithology, Ornithological Society's um, classification checklist. But it also has all of these other classifications. And um, so here it has, <clears throat> this classification has it in the old family Perulidae with warblers and um, so various other classifications. So all of these are being pulled in from the Global Names Project. And you can, as a collection manager or curator, you can choose the Arctos classification, another classification, or you can actually build your own, create your own classification. Um, okay, so, um, other things, if we go back to, I'm gonna go back to the search. One thing is you end up with a lot of windows. So um, I'm gonna close them as I go through this. So I'm gonna go back to search catalog records. So what other things might you wanna search on if you're interested in, in bird data? Well, one thing you might wanna search on are attributes. So attributes are things like weight, sex, age, things like that. And those are down here under the catalog record block. And again, I had to um, uh, show more options in order to see that. Um, and so one thing to, to note about Arctos is that attributes are collection type specific. So there are bird attributes, there are herp attributes, there are mammal attributes. Some of these attributes are gonna be the same like sex but other attributes are gonna be specific to the collection type. Um, so skull ossification or mold, things like that might be specific to bird collections. And so say I'm only interested in um, adult birds. So birds that have 100% ossified skulls. So you can pick here are all the different attributes and this is um, <clears throat> not just bird specific, but all, across all the different collection types. And so you can scroll down, you can see there's lots of different options here. Um, and when you're doing data entry, I should mention, um, cause I'm not gonna talk that much about data entry, but when you're doing data entry and you're entering a new MVZ, a new bird record, whatever institution it is, you're only gonna see the attributes that are um, assigned to bird collection types. So you're not gonna see um, all of these this entire list. You'll just see a subset of the list that's specific to bird collections. So, so we have a field called skull ossification and we can search there for birds that have 100% ossified skull and we're going to change this to contains. 
Um, let's see what we come up with. While it's rolling there, Carla, I'm just going to mention for everyone, if you are interested about data entry or where to figure out the different types of parts and things, um, we do have short tutorials on each of those available at the links that Emily put up at the beginning. And if anyone would like, I'll also put uh, the info for how to find the other tutorial info in the chat. Okay, yeah, thanks Beth. Yeah, so you can see we have over 11,000. So of the 467,000 records, over 11,000, almost 12,000 of them have some data in the skull ossification field where the skull is 100% ossified. Um, you could also enter some people like we, for example, at MVZ don't use skull ossification as a field. We enter all of our data into age. Um, and you'll see that there's also an age class field, but just for legacy historical reasons, we have all of our data in age. And so we continue to use that field. Um, and you can do the same thing. You can enter 100% in there, contains, and let's see what that gives you. Um, So there's different options for you know using attributes depending on how you do things um, in your own collection. So you'll see most of these are MBZ um, 1900 records, which um, isn't that many, but anyway. Um, so so lots of flexibility there. Another thing that you might want to search on are parts. So for example, um, one thing you might want to search on is what wings that you're interested in wings um, what wings do we have in the collection um, and so you can search on wing and i'm going to add class aves again so i want to know what bird wings we have and we'll do search um, And as you see there, if you do an equals, you, you'll get an exact match, but you don't want to necessarily do that because it may be entered as a spread wing or a dry wing or, you know, something like that. And so, um, let's see what. So we have actually quite a lot of wings, um, over, over 7,500 wings. Um, and so, um, we can just click on, I'm going to click on this, this goose. This is from the Chicago Academy. Um, it's a Canada goose. Um, it gives you information about the, um, the condition of the wing, um, its location. That's another thing that we can track in Arctos, um, our locations, both either through attributes or also through object tracking if things are barcoded. Um, and you can see that there's a picture of the wing. If you click on that, there's a nice, nice picture of the wing. Um, you'll see at the, from the URL, and I should mention this at the start, but all of the data in Arctos are at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And so that's where this image is being stored. Um, and I'll talk more about media later, but you can store media basically anywhere. It doesn't have to be a TAC. Um, you just need to um, have a, basically have a URL. So if you have your own server and you want to, or, or media that are on some other website or whatever, you can, and can also link to those as well. Um, um, the other thing, another thing to point out here is you'll see like some records like this one has two events associated with it. So if you click on, on one of those, um, you'll see here's the first event and here's the second event. Um, and it may be unverified or unaccepted because the coordinates have changed or something's changed about this. So Arctos tracks that history. Um, but you can also actually track multiple events that are still valid. For example, um, if you're taking biopsies of, of animals, um, that are banded or, or marked in some way and you repeatedly capture the animal at different places at different times, you can track that through this multiple event feature of Arctis. So it kind of serves two purposes. One is to track um, organisms at different 
um, in the wild at different places at different times, but also to track history. If there's like a, a change in, in data, you can track that history. Uh, okay, so um, then let's go back to our search. Um, um, so we can say, okay, well, what about, what do you have in the way of duck wings? And so we can search by order and seriformes. And again, search by wing. Uh, let's see what we come up with for just ducks. And the part searches are really valuable. Those are some of the things I get most from people requests for, do you have, as Carla said, duck wings for teaching? Which ones do you have? And things like that. The ability of Arctos to be able to search specifically for that um, really makes it powerful, I think. Yeah, so here's our results, 1600. Um, Right now it's sorted by the GUID. So that's the institution, the collection type and the, um, the catalog number. And you can see like here we have Chicago Academy of Sciences bird. And then these are these five or, or six are in the teaching uh, are in their teaching collection. And then the Denver Museum of Natural Science. But you can also sort this in different ways. So I wanna get all of the um, uh, species, or same identifications together. So you can sort it that way. You can sort it, you know, geographically. You can expand um, what you see here. So you can customize your results by adding or removing data fields. So say you also want to see the collector um, or the, you know, the, a, the sex or any of these things. So lots of different options for how to, um, how, what you actually view and what you see here in the result set um is what will get downloaded and so um you need to in order to download and you need do need to be logged in um you can map all the results in berkeley mappers um you can say okay i, I want to remove certain rows because i don't want to map those or or whatever so there's certain things that you can do without being logged in and then there's more things that you can do with being logged in um and then if you want to even do this even further and we get this a lot you can search for everything that's got a duck wing oops, and with tissues um, so you can use uh, use less values we'll fill in those values again so in seriformes and wing and then you can say require tissues and hit search and so that should narrow it down to fewer with tissues So most of the 1600 actually have tissues. So that's interesting. Um, okay, so so lots of things that you can do when you're without being logged in. But obviously there's more that you can do with being logged in. So that's what we're gonna do now. So I'm gonna log, log in, so uh, into my account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, so so one of the nice things, one of the, I think, most useful features about Arctos is that we, um, we share a lot of data. So when you're logged in, you can look at things like you can access um, and, and edit agents, you can do data entry. You'll see that I have a lot more tabs here where I can manage, manage the data, um, view certain reports, things like that. Um, but we also share a lot of data. So we share things like localities and collecting events. And that's really, really useful. Um, I use that a lot because um, when I'm cataloging new specimens, new accessions into Arctos, a lot of times the locality or even the event will already exist. And so I can take advantage of work that's been done to georeference existing localities and use that rather than creating a new locality that needs to be georeferenced. And just as an example of that, um, I'm currently working on an accession of um, 
specimens that we got from a rehab center. Well, we got them through through MSB, but the specimens came from a rehab center, so they're mostly mostly New Mexico specimens. And because MSB is in Arctos, MVC, you know, obviously there are a lot of New Mexico specimens in Arctos. Um, and so we can look up localities and say, okay, does this locality already exist? And if it does, does it have a georeference? And if it does, let's use that. And we can select that unique locality ID either in the individual data entry screen or in the bulk loader um, uh, spreadsheet. And so there's two ways of of entering data. One is through individual records and one is through bulk loading. Um, so, so I'm in the process of doing that. So I thought I'd just give one example because it raised actually some kind of interesting things that we came across. <laughs> so one of the localities in this new accession is Capilla Peak Manzano Mountains. And so if you go to manage data loca location, find locality and enter, um, I'll enter New Mexico. And then oops, um, under specific locality, Capilla Peak Manzano Mountains. Um, and uh, you can just see, you can search by lots of different options, both for higher geography and also for specific locality um, or locality attributes. Um, so I'm gonna look for matches. Um, and there's five records. And the first thing I noticed right away is that we have this location in two different counties. Um, so, oh, um, which is the right county? Um, so, I'll, well, I looked it up and it, it is in Torrance County. So Bernalillo, Bernalillo County is incorrect, um, but we'll get to that in a bit. So, so you can scroll over to the right and you can see um, some of these have WKTs. Here's the locality. Some have elevations. You can have an elevational range um, if you, if appropriate. Here's um, four of the five have coordinates. Um, three of those coordinates were obtained by GPS. Um, and then one of the coordinates was obtained from um, geolocate, which is a set of semi-automated georeferencing um, tool that is a plug-in to Arctis. And so you can actually georeference directly in Arctis and save those coordinates back to, um, to your locality. And so because all I have is Capilla Peak and I don't have any GPS data, I'm going to look at that one. So choose that one. So I'm going to scroll back over here and I'm going to just go to edit. And you'll see there's one locality here, MSB Herps. Okay, so I'm like, well, okay, that's interesting. It's got Bernalillo County. You'll see here in this box um, that it says, if you're seeing this, users are failing to find your specimens. In other words, something is wrong with this locality. Um, and so it uses these um, georeferencing um, services to look and see whether the coordinates that you have are actually um, matching the county that it's in. And, and in this case, it's saying no, um, they do not share the same higher geography. And so here are some other options that you might consider. Um, if I click on the record, you'll see it comes up with zero. And the reason for that is because I'm logged in as me and I don't have access to MSB HERP data. So in order for me to actually look at that record, I would need to either log out of here or open a different browser where like a Firefox browser and then query <clears throat> and query without being logged in in order to get more information about that particular record. Um, so I'm not gonna do that right now, um, but that kind of shows how the permissions work in Arctis. Um, where it's set up as a virtual private database. And so although some data are shared, other data like individual specimen data are private so that you know somebody from MVZ can't change an MSB record. So how do we fix this incorrect locality? Um, well, if you have the right permissions, you can fix it yourself. Um, you can also contact the collection manager for the herpetology collection at MSB and say, hey, there's something wrong with this record. Or you can also annotate the record. Um, and so if you, um, 
I don't have it up here, but if you if you were actually logged out and, and pulled up the record in the upper right, you'll see a link that says report bad data. And so you can click on that and actually create an annotation, which is what I'm going to do that says, you know, the county for this is incorrect. It should be um, Torrance County. Um, you'll also see in the, well, maybe I will log out. Hold on. Um, so log out. I'm going to pull up that record. Um, so go back over here to catalog records. I'm going to search MSB HERP. Um, if you do, if you do Museum of Southwestern Biology, Amphibian and Reptile Specimens. Um, and it's uh, 340. Is that right? That's right. So, so when you're logged out, what Carla did was you can search one collection or multiple collections at once or all Arctis, just in case anyone was a little confused. Right. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> um, so here's the MSB herp record. Um, it's a, <clears throat> a garter snake. Um, and you can see here again in the locality block that it's got the map has a red box around it. So again, that tells you that flags that something is not correct with this locality. Um, if, and so if it were changed to Torrance County, that red box would turn green and it would be all happy. So, um, so anyway, a lot of nice tools for, and we just happened to randomly find this when, when kind of looking for things to, to talk about in this webinar. So, you know, there are errors out there, but it's pretty easy to fix them and pretty easy to find them. So that's kind of a nice feature of Arctis as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to log back in. Um, another, oops. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll get rid of that. Hold on. Um, let me go back to. Okay, so am I logged in? I'm still logged in. So um, the other thing you can do, if we go back to edit this, say I'm not super, in, um, there's something wrong, I don't like those coordinates, or there's something about this that I don't like. Um, I can create a new locality, but I can clone it and um, change whatever it is that I wanna change because I think the coordinates are better you know, here than there, or my locality has a certain elevation or, or something like that. You can also search on all collecting events associated with that locality. So even if I don't have access to the record, I have access to the collecting event, which shows when it was collected. And I used that a lot. We accessioned a large collection of all the specimens from Utah State, and a lot of them actually had collecting events already in Arctis. And so I tried to take advantage of those dates as well as the localities and the georeferences. Um, okay. So another thing that you can search on, go back to catalog records, is relationships. And so Arctis is one, I think one of the big strengths of Arctis is its ability to handle relationships and, and it can handle relationships both among different specimens in the same collection um, or in a different collection in the same institution or in a different institution in Arctis or in other non-Arctis institutions as long as there is a URL that you can link to. Um, so in this case, I'm going to search on, I'm interested in, say, predator-prey relationships. So I'm going to search on the genus Budio. So hawks. And I'm going to go down here to uh, relationships. And you can see all of the different options for relationships. Um, so collected with, I use that a lot. If I, you know, collect a pair or something like that, you can see ate, eaten by, host of, for parasites. Um, so Arctos has a lot of host parasite relationships. Um, sometimes it's the same individual as, so the, you may have the tissue sample, but the voucher is somewhere else. And so you can link those um, and say it's the same individual as this. Um, so we're just going to look and see what Budio have eaten. Okay, so we only have seven records. 
they're mapped here. Um, <clears throat> and so we're going to look at this one here to start with. So this is a Denver Museum um, red tail hawk um, from the Rocky Mountain Raptor program. And you can see here the relationships. So it ate a mammal in the DMNS collection and you can, or institution, and you can um, click on the mammal and you can get more information, all the same details about that mammal, it's a microtus. And then that mammal was eaten by that hawk. And so you can go back to the bird record that way. You'll also see in this one that the red tail hawk is a host of a parasite. And so if you click on the parasite data, you can get all the information about the parasite. And um, again, you can reciprocally link back to the host. Um, you can see here, um, see this has a green box that's all nice and happy with the locality. Here are all the attributes about the hawk. Um, so um, both ectoparasites and endoparasites were examined, but ectos were detected um, and saved. So here are the parts. And so in the attributes, you can describe the, um, the parasites, you can, but you may not save them. But if you save them, you can enter it as a part. And so this is a skeleton with a bunch of different tissue samples of paras ectoparasites and feather. Um, separate feather samples. So that's kind of a cool record. Um, this is another one. This is an MVZ bird, um, red-shouldered hawk. Um, we got this one from Lindsay Wildlife Hospital. It's a local rehab center. And in this case, it ate um, a herp. And so you can click on the herp. Same thing. It's a gopher snake. Links back to the bird. Um, in this case, you can see here the gopher snake it's a whole organism in ethanol with tissue and you can see that the tissue has been barcoded and here's the entire path of where that tissue um, is located in our liquid nitrogen freezers. So that's a whole nother webinar is object tracking and there's a lot of information about that as well. Um, too much to go into here. Um, and again, here's all of the details about um, the, the hawk. Um, and in this case, um, we described the stomach contents, but we also, again, saved the stomach contents. So same thing here. So it says what, what was in the stomach. Um, it also had a Jerusalem cricket, which we did not save, I guess. Or maybe we did. I'm not sure. Um, OK, so that's relationships. Um, and um, OK, so now I'm going to go into talking about transactions. Unless anybody has any questions up to this point. Any questions? Okay, so transactions are basically accessions, loans, and permits. And again, you need specific operator permission to be able to manage transactions. But if you do, then in Arctos, once you're logged in, you go to transactions, you can create, a, create or find an accession, create or find a loan borrows, if you're borrowing specimens, or permits. Um, and so we're going to look at loans for a minute. So let's do find loan. And you can search by loan number by lots of different options, like person, um, who received the loan, um, the status of the loan, is it, uh, is it open? You know, give me all the open loans. Um, the type of the loan. Um, the due dates, transaction dates, things like that. So I'm just going to search and go to MVZ bird. I wish this window were a little bit bigger, but MVZ bird. And then I'm going to search nature of material calypti. So Anna's hummingbirds, because we just did a big one of that. I'm going to do fine loans. So this shows you all the different loans. You can download them as a CSV. You can map the shipments. I've actually never done that. <laughs> Um, and some of these have zero items because um, this one was frozen carcasses, so they actually weren't cataloged in the MVZ. So it'll only show the account there if you're actually if you're loaning cataloged items. Um, apparently, we were supposed to get these things back, and we never did. 
Um, and one thing about loans too is that you can see like what's open and what's closed and Arctos has a um, has a lot of tools for automatic notifications and one of them is for loans and so if there's a loan that's due if you set a due date um, then it will notify you you don't need to set a due date but if you do set a due date then it will notify you periodically before that due date um, that this loan is is due and then it's overdue and so you can write to the recipient and say do you need an extension or um, can you send them back things like that um, and so you'll see the different kinds of this is a transfer of custody we actually donated some wings some hummingbird wings so we don't expect to get those back um, this is a returnable loan that we do expect to get back, but apparently we never, we haven't. Um, um, here's a consumable. So these are tissue samples. Um, and um, you can also do in-house loans. Here's, um, here's one from the teaching collection, from our teaching collection. So again, zero items. So we track basically pretty much everything that goes out of the museum, even if they're not cataloged or they're from their teaching collection. Um, so just to track usage of the collections. Um, here's <clears throat> um, one that was uh, some eggs and nests that were sent for um, a, uh, a filming, a video. Um, and then you can also do in-house things. So this was a, a loan that we created for a graduate student in an undergraduate project who actually measured all of these hummingbird skins in-house. And so we created a loan just so we could track that. Um, Another thing is, is you can see that that we have links to projects and I'll talk a little bit more about products later, um, but you can you can create projects um, That uh, are linked to transactions. Um, and so this is a little description of the project who was involved in it. Um, different projects that contributed records to that project and all of the specimens that were used and you can click on that you can map those, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, okay, so that's um, kind of the basics about loans. And then I wanted to talk up too about permits because I know for ornithology collections in particular, permits are a big deal. So you can, um, so we do track permits. Um, right now we don't actually um, have a way of uploading permits in a way that's, that's not public um, because media, all media are public. And so if you uploaded, a PDF or, or an image of a permit, it would actually be public. And so we're working on getting more secure media storage so we can actually upload permits and not have them be public. Um, but you can search by permit number who issued it um, or who it was issued to. So I'm gonna search on Beth's, see what Beth's been up to. <laughs> and um, so here you can see it's issued by, who was issued by, um, it, these already expired. Um, this one expires in 432 days and you can see that it's a renewal. So you can actually create renewals and link permits together. Um, and it tells you kind of what the, what the dates were um, for that permit, um, what the permit was for, um, what the regulations are basically. Um, like migratory, if it's a migratory bird permit, you can add that as well. And um, so you can edit the permit, uh, let's edit this one. Um, and so this one actually doesn't have the regulations linked to it because that's something we added more recently, but you can actually assign certain regulations like a site, this is a CITES permit or an MBTA permit to a particular um, type of authorization. Um, you can also look at accessions. Uh, let's see if there's any accessions not being matched. Um, uh, I'm not sure which one. Let's try this one. Nothing matched. <laughs> okay, well, if there are accessions linked to permits, then um, you can get the list of those accessions. Um, you can also link permits to loans as well. Like if you have a uh, permit that's required for an export or an import, things like that. Um, so, um, and they don't have to be necessarily formal permits. It can also be things like this letter of authorization. Um, so so it's, it's really great for being able to sort of track things um, in Arctos and make sure that everything is being done legally. Um, anything else to say on that, Beth? 
No, I generally add permits when I'm going through and adding accessions. That way I tie them up close, but it's also a good idea if you're doing things like loans. Um, so you make sure that you have all the paperwork you need to actually send that loan out or to receive that loan. Um, and you can put multiple people under a permit. So if you have like sub permittees, uh, and the other thing that does come up, um, I'm not sure I have them in there yet, but I have a migratory bird banding um, permit. And so you can add things for things like observations or uh, tissue samples, like I do blood and feather samples for that. So if you work with banders, uh, you can store their permits. And it's really nice to have them on hand to know who you need to ask if they're donating more specimens, you can check really fast and sit there and go, oh, I also need your most recent permit, please. Oh, and then there's hunting permits, right? Yeah, hunting permits, right. So there's lots of different options for, if we just click on, uh, let's see. Um, I'm not gonna save it, but I'll just hit a create a renewal. Oh wait, I don't, actually I don't wanna do that. Um, uh, let's see where, yeah, I think it's, uh, never mind. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, but there are, there are, there are lots of different options. So we kind of tried to, so we'll, we got money uh, a couple of years ago to sort of revamp how we dealt with permits because of the global genome biodiversity network. And so, um, <clears throat> which requires permits for, for tissues that are in there, um, exported to their aggregator database. And so we combined the type of permit it is like collecting and salvage and the regulations like MBTA. Um, but as Beth said, you can add hunting licenses and fishing licenses or other sort of non-standard types of permits as well. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to projects and publications. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about projects, um, but Arctos has a, a big uh, module for, for tracking uses of the collection and for sort of, uh, it's a great way of sort of linking things together um, through through uh, projects. And one nice thing about Arctos as a shared database is that different institutions may get the same request, say for tissue samples for the same project. And so we can link um, records from multiple institutions to a single project. Um, so I'm gonna search in this case, I'm gonna search on egg I, um, and I'm going to search on and here over on the right you can does it cite the collection I'm going to look at ones that cite um, cite specimens in Arctos um, so you can add citations to publications and those will show up on the specimen detail page um, but you can search by title you can search by participant if you know what it is but um, let's just search on egg projects let's, um, so you'll see on the left is a list of the projects and on the right is a list of the publications that contain egg somewhere. So some of these are actually about eggs. So here's one that I added not too long ago using 3D printed eggs to examine egg rejection behavior. And it's got one cited specimen. Um, here's the specimen. Um, you can click on that, you'll see it's oh, in this case it's interesting so here's again getting back to identification so this is a uh, american goldfinch with a brown-headed cowbird egg in the um in the nest so it's it's a nest parasite so again you can add um through identifications you can add those sorts of things as well um it's a voucher of the goldfinch um in in and the the cowbird in this publication with the link to the, the DOI. So you can actually go to the publication. Um, here's um, at MVZ, we actually cataloged um, all of our, um, I mean, we, we took digital photos of all of our eggs and nest specimens because it's the one collection that we don't loan out. So here's a picture of that again up at TAC. In this case, it looks like um, we only have the cowbird egg. Um, and um, let me go back to projects. Oops. Um, and oh, and you can see here that you'll see, you know, in, if you if in the, just the general results um, 
page, you'll see that it has a media and a voucher and that it's a voucher of something. So, so that kind of information is just on the basic results um, output, but then to dig down further, you need to click on the, the actual record. Um, but it also includes, if you search on something like egg, you're also gonna get things like Clegg, which is obviously not about eggs. Um, and um, I'm gonna click on this one here because this is a this was kind of a, a, a really showcases the use of our digital images. So this is a project that um, Cassie Stoddard did and published a paper in Science about it. Um, here's a link to the publication, um, so you can link directly to the publication. And it cited over 13,000 specimens. So basically, what she did was she took digital all of the digital images in our collection um, and so 13,000 cited specimens with something like 40 something thousand actual 49,000 eggs and did this analysis looking at the evolution of egg-shaped variation in birds and um, so that's a really really nice um, example of sort of the use of the collection. And, and this was a grant, the digitization was done on an N NSF grant. So it's actually a nice way to showcase to funding agencies, how the collections are used. And I have to say that when, after we digitized um, and took digital images and put them online for our egg collection, the use of the collection has really gone way up than, um, because before you had to come visit the museum to see any of our eggs. Um, you can again, so here's, I'm not going to do it, but you can click on all of the records, you can map them. Um, and here are eight projects that contributed records to this one. So these are all historic surveys where they collected eggs. So that kind of makes sense. This one is like, well, why is there, why is this related? Um, well, it turns out that, so this is another project that um, was basically focused on, as it says, food webs and seabirds. Um, so unrelated to egg shape variation or anything or eggs at all, but where they actually donated a couple of marbled murrelet um, eggs to the MVZ. And so those eggs were used in this egg shape variation project. And so it kind of links these different uses and, and accessions and together, which is kind of neat. Another thing is that we had, there was a lot of media associated with this paper and so I linked those so you can see like here's a science news article um, you click on that um, you'll get the, the actual article so so it's really um, a great way to showcase again use of the collection which is important for all of us for um, funding agencies for administrators things like that um, Carla can I mention while you're on that page if you click back into there um, Back into where? Just oh, into the, the project. Sure. Um, Arctos does have this little cross ref um, widget. So you can see uh, right there, it's actually showing how many people have then gone on to reference her paper. So you can kind of um, showcase the, the downstream impacts of that project. So not only your own project, but people who have then referenced that work. So it's a nice yeah. little plugin. Yeah, thanks. I did, actually didn't know that. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and these DOIs. So if you just um, put in the DOI and cross-ref it when you edit the, the when you are entering the publication, um, it will automatically fill in the other details. The other thing to note is that I didn't create the loan and add the 13,000 egg records one by one. So there's a lot of tools for batch loading data so there's one, one of those tools and i can go up here to the top enter data so this is your data entry your you know bulk loading uh new records but then there's all these batch tools and so i use this a lot batch bulk load loan items so if you have a um if you have a spreadsheet in a certain format um some fields are required some are not um, it's really easy to, all you need basically is the part name and the, the catalog number and you can batch upload um, the loan items. So I do that a lot for bigger loans. Um, there's a lot of other sort of batch tools that are also really useful. Um, you can bulk load agents, um, citations um, is another thing. So you don't have to do these, these things one by one. Um, 
Okay, so we're running out of time. So I think that's mostly, okay. So that, oh, one other project. So the, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about how Arctis is in just a collection. Um, just a, is, it's not just used for research, but it's also used for art, art, artists use actually um, our collections a lot. And so we can track that in Arctos and um, Beth has actually done a great job of, of doing that. And so I'm gonna just search on, um, and maybe Beth can talk a little bit about this person because I don't know anything about her. And Geo. So um, one of the major uses since I've gotten to University of Wyoming has actually been by artists from our art department. And then that really inspired me to get a lot of our undergraduates involved with creating art. Um, and so Frances Nago is a, was an undergraduate. She was also a curatorial assistant and she was a double major in uh, zoology, physiology, and art, I think with a painting emphasis, or she might've just had a minor in painting. Um, but if Carlos scrolls up just a little bit, you can see I created a project for a show that my uh, students and researchers involved with the museum put on. And then I added all of their different names to it um, and their designations. So you can search by any of those people and you can see uh, the work that they've done. And then the big thing I wanted to do for this was to emphasize the art that was actually created from the museum, because I found that really hard sometimes to search and figure out what artists have created, because sometimes it doesn't necessarily get on the internet in a publication that's easy with a DOI to reference. So I run around and I make sure either the artists take images for me or I take images during the show and then I can link those. And if Carla wants to choose any of those uh, media there that I've linked to this project, you can see, so Francis created a felt representation of a Western tanager. And then if Carla goes back into the details, um, I linked it specifically to Francis who produced it, to the project art in the museum, and then to the specific specimen that she told me she used to inspire that sculpture. Yeah, I think that's a great, great way to to showcase. And we we should do more of that here because we have a lot of artistic uses that we don't really track like that. Yeah, and it's really helpful actually, it turns out for the artists because there's not, there are searchable databases of art associated with art museums, but it's hard to get links from those to where they got their inspiration or necessarily tied into their names. And a lot of them are focused on really well-known artists. So I also have been selling this to our art department if they use our uh, collection as, hey, if you give me your info and which specimens do you used, your uh, art will actually get online and be searchable through a different database. Thanks. Okay, so in the five minutes that we have left, I just want to talk about media. So because we have, as you can see, we have a lot of media. Um, there's two ways to search for media in Arctis. One is by going to search media. And if you enter a keyword um, like Pipolo and you search on anything and hit find media, you're going to get pretty much all different kinds of everything that's in Arctis. So this is a good example because it has um, the first one is actually a scan of a ledger um, from Robert Rausch, and that um, that ledger or catalog has been tagged in Arctos. So Arctos has tagging tools that allow you to actually link that page in the ledger to a particular specimen. Um, and so down below, I think it's the next page is. Um, uh, uh, Pipolo, here's a description on page 56, it talks about Pipolo. Um, um, <clears throat> um, so, and then here the next ones are audio recordings and you can see that there's a built-in audio player. And so we've, um, as part of the same grant that digitized our, um, and took photos of our egg collection, we also digitized all of our audio recordings. And so we uploaded those as WAV files to the Texas Advanced Computing Center who then converted them to mp3 files and you can um, play play that directly here 
um, and it's good. There's a bunch of different um, options for how to label media and you can relate media to specimens. You can relate media to agents, um, things like that. Um, let's see if there's, this one should be related to, yeah, this is related to, I'm not sure why it's showing there, but it's related to, in this case, it's an observational specimen. So uh, I was gonna talk about that in a minute, but so Arctos can accommodate both specimens and observations. And some of the observations, the observations are typically in a different catalog, but they share all of the same data, um, taxonomy, identification, locality, events, all that stuff. And um, so observations could be basically something like, well, there's no physical object in the museum, but you have an audio recording. We would catalog that as an observational record. Um, but it could also be, and we're going to be doing this, um, straight point count survey data, things like that. So, for example, for um, our resurvey projects here in the MVZ, we have both specimens and um, point count survey data tied to the same events, essentially, and the same project. And so we can add that and sort of tie it all together. I um, mean, you can see here that this MP3 is derived from this WAV file. Um, I think if you click on it, it'll also show here's the MP3, here's the WAV file, and, and then so there's a reciprocal linkage back and forth. And you can actually relate different images as well, like photo retakes, for example, can be related to each other. And you'll see that it also includes, if um, I, you know, landscape, habitat photos, things like that. So basically, if you search media, you're going to get all sorts of everything that's associated with whatever it is that you searched on. Um, if you only are interested in um, media associated with catalog records, then go to the catalog record search. And you can search here under the uh, same thing, genus Pipolo. And uh, down here, you'll see uh, media. And you can search on anything or just I want audio recordings. I'm only interested in audio recordings. And so it's going to search that. And so there's a lot of them, most of them I've done. And um, so you can click and you can click on any one of these. And again, you'll, you'll get the, um, you'll see here, the media is embedded with a player. It's linked to a project, again, all the same data. Um, and if you go down here, you'll see, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can actually change how many you, you see. So I'm just gonna change that real fast. Um, and you can see, so here are observations. So um, a bunch of observations. So these are ones where we only have the recording and not the specimen. And then up here are ones where we have the actual vouchered recordings. Um, and so, um, so you know, Arctos is great again because because it allows you to incorporate all of these different kinds of data and tie it all together through these shared. Um, tables like localities and agents and also through things like projects. Um, so that's right around one o'clock and I know I um, didn't leave any time for questions, but <laughs> I got through everything. So <laughs> that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Carla and Beth. That was awesome. A great fly through of Arctis. <laughs> Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I realize it is the, uh, we're at time, but if anyone does have questions, uh, I think we're all happy to stick around. Uh, so feel free to use the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and happy to answer anything you might have. Yeah, I'm looking through questions. Um, oh, cool. Color our collections. That's cool. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions or I'm happy to, you know, we're happy to answer things offline to you. I know some of you like Aaron is just coming into Arctis. Um, so there's a lot here, but um, yeah, oh yeah, Alabama's coming in next. So we're happy to, uh, anybody who's adding bird data and has questions or needs some advice or guidance, feel free to write to us. We're happy to to help you guys. Yeah, and feel free to check out um, webinars and tutorials because this is a great overview, but there's lots of in-depth um, info if you're new to barcoding or anything like that, anything that didn't get totally covered. Yeah, and data entry, I really didn't cover very much. Um, so, um, you know, again, there's, we've had 
webinar specific to a lot of these individual topics like media, data entry, bulk loading, labels. I didn't talk about labels. That's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> so it's hard to cover everything. Um, but there's a lot of really good documentation and sort of how to's and we are working on we should need to revisit that the video tutorials, short video tutorials kind of forgot about those with COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, yeah, Lars, there are uh, some a couple non US institutions in Arctos. Um, I'll just go and grab our data portal page and you can see who's in there. I believe um, Madagascar. Madagascar. Yeah, is in there. And there's also is it Korea? Um, right? Didn't Korea just join? Not necessarily bird collections. Um, we are, you know, that is something that we, we have had a number of conversations with different um, non US collections or institutions. So we are um, in those discussions and have reached out and we're definitely interested in, in adding more non US collections. Yeah, and I just linked to our portals page so you can see a listing of, of the different institutions. Cool. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks, everyone, again, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, Carla yeah. and Beth. Yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, letting us talk about birds. Always <laughs> the best. We like talking about birds, I know. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you guys later. All right, see ya. Bye.